Well, you had to wait longer than we thought for points three and four on uh, the extension, the completion of the message we began last Sunday about waiting well. And our, our story is rooted in that famous story of the prodigal son, Jesus told us in Luke chapter 15, and we talked about how well the prodigal's father waited, and what a good example that is for us, what a good example it is for me. And uh, last week, we did points one and two of that. I think we have them on the next slide there. Well, wait well is our title. You remember that little picture? And go ahead, Bruce, to the next one there. We talked about these first two points, and I mentioned to everyone last week that this is uh, rooted in the crucible of life. I've had my turn waiting, my turn's waiting, and I've, I'm learning some things along the way. I'm glad to share those with you. Last week, we talked about don't freak out. And uh, instead of just thinking of the prodigal as the son, let's go ahead and think of the prodigal, the many prodigals that we may have in our lives, whether it be a parent or a sibling or a neighbor, someone you, you have known that was one time walking closely with the Lord and has taken a retreat. They've gone prodigal. They're wasting the opportunity that they have to know and to serve the Lord. So it's with all of those folks in mind and for all of the other things too. And let me just check to see if I'm not the only one in the room. Anybody here still have a situation or some circumstances or a family need that you're waiting to have resolved? Thought so. I thought I was keeping good company this morning and I am. And so as we wait, let's wait well And we'll talk about uh, that for a couple more points. And then I kind of put the icing on the cake, really what the wait is all about. Okay, you up for that? Let's do it. A few years ago, uh, uh, Carol and Gary Leonard joined me and Kelly up in Canada to the same place where my son and grandson and I went fishing a couple of weeks ago. And uh, as can happen this time of year, uh, Gary asked me before he and Carol went up what kind of weather should we plan on? And I said, well, it can range anything from snow to 90 degrees in sunburn weather. And so we prepared for such, and it really does uh, that time, this time of year in that part of the country do that. And uh, it, it was in fact raining our first morning to go out fishing when Gary and Carol were there. And uh, I remember uh, my buddy who owns the fishing camp, his name is Bill, Bill Blackman, when he said, well, Gary, you need to get your rain gear. And Gary's reply was, well, you're talking to a man who hasn't had much experience with rain. And I re- the years that we lived in Acuna, as I look back on those years, it was three years, I felt like I waited on it to rain all three years. And so in this part of the country, we know what dry can be. And we all know better than to complain about rain, don't we? Because we know that every drop that we get is welcome, and we're glad for all of it. Well, you have, having lived in this part of the country, seen God's faithfulness. And one day, you know, it was during one of those long periods of drought that this country knows so well, that James Lee Leonard said, well, it'll rain when it needs to. And I thought, there's a man who's been able to watch, and he's seen the faithfulness of God over the years. Well, let's transfer that kind of sentiment over to the waiting that we're doing for those situations to be resolved, for those friends or family members to return. And just to think about it, you know, I too have now lived long enough that I've seen some situations resolved. And I've seen some situations actually that ended up better than if there had never been a problem in the first place. You've seen that too, haven't you? And, uh, you know, the month of May was the wettest month on record for the state of Texas. And uh, we had our too. In, uh, in Texas, 35 trillion gallons of rain fell on Texas. And that would be enough for all of Texas if you spread it all out and took part of that that Houston got and spread it all over Texas, it would be eight inches deep. So that's a welcome thing, is it not? We're so glad about that kind of rain because do you remember the summer of 2011? It's the summer that Texas burned. The big fire in Bastrop, 
thousands of homes and businesses were burned. Big fire out west of Alpine that went north long, long way. Hundreds of thousands of acres burned. And it was in the August of that summer, the way I remember it, it's anchored in my mind, uh, we sold all of our cows. I, w I didn't think highly enough of them to pump $100 a row of hay through them. And so we sold them all. And so that was the dry summer. But then when you look at the dry summer of 2011 through May of 2016, you see, you know what? Things were resolved. And so as we continue to wait, we're waiting on the one who provides when it's the right time for it to be provided. When it rains, it'll be because it needs to. It'll be because it, because it has to. So hang in there. And let me look at this next uh, slide there. You know, when it rains, let it. And I remember speaking to Gary, too. He, he was so surprised that for some people, rain is a bad thing. Oh, no, it's a rainy day. He said, I didn't, it had never occurred to me that for some people, rain would be bad. But to a lot of people, I guess that's what they think of a rainy day. Oh, no, it's raining. But uh, if, what, whether it's, oh, no, it's dry or, oh, no, it's raining, when it's that way, just let it. That's what Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said. The best thing you can do when it's raining is let it rain. And so if you're still waiting for it to rain, just let it. Let it wait. Because the next point up here is God's got this. He's got it all under control. He's watching closely and he has not taken a vacation and doesn't know about the need. One of the things that gives me a great deal of uh, solace when I'm waiting is knowing the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in John 16, and you've probably heard these verses before, and uh, in verses 8, I just picked two out of this passage, John 16, verse 8 and verse 13. It talks about the power of the Holy Spirit to convince and, convince and to convict and how often have we prayed for that one for whom we are waiting? Oh, Lord, please speak to them. Speak to them in the depths of their soul. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit, God himself, has direct access to the heart of every prodigal. You know, we live in a day that when our phone rings, we look to see who's calling, don't we? And how often do we just put it back in our pocket and don't answer Remember the days, the scary days, when the phone rang, you didn't have any idea who it was? You always answered. But now, when I'm making a call and it's not answered, I'm thinking, oh, he saw it was for me. He didn't want to talk to me. Did anybody else feel like that? I do sometimes. But you know what? God never gets the busy signal. The Holy Spirit's ability to convict is real. And I saw a post this week that if, you're, if your first battery-powered toy was a hot shot, you may be a redneck. Let's see that next, uh, that, that next deal. Has anybody ever played with a hot shot before? Yeah, our cattle prod. Yeah, we have, and mine's at the farm. Or I would have brought it with me today, but uh, then you would have been frightened by that maybe. But... Uh, I, I try to think, what is a way that I can grasp the fact that God has absolute access to the heart of my prodigal friends? And I don't know if any of you have been in these contexts. I'll describe it to you. Sometimes when you're trying to load a cow in a trailer, you yell and scream at her, you twist her tail, you slap her on the rump. Sometimes you... Put a rope around her neck or around her horns and then dally it to a saddle horn and try to drag her in the trailer and she just balks. But walk up behind her with one of those. Springs into the trailer. That is the power that the Holy Spirit has in our lives and in the lives of our prodigals. The prodigals for whom we are waiting. He has direct access. The phone is always answered. And we can take great comfort in the fact that God is speaking to them. He's talking to them. 
He's encouraging them, even the way that we would encourage a cow maybe to get in the trailer. But God has this. He has direct access to the heart of any of the prodigals that may be in our lives. So those are the four points right there. Don't freak out. God won't let go. Remember that? Pete helped me with that one. God's got this. It'll rain when it needs to. And the Holy Spirit has direct access to the heart of all of the prodigals. Well, I got to thinking, you know, what, what is the real subject of the wait? You know, we, I think that fretting comes when I'm waiting on an individual or if I'm waiting on a circumstance to change. Then that's a fretful thing, isn't it? Waiting on that. But how about we switch the direct object of our weight, not to the prodigal, not to the circumstance, but what if we really do do what the scriptures tell us to do? Last week I shared Psalm 27, 14, a psalm that I've gone to bed with many thousands of times. It says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the who? On the Lord. Our wait is not for the prodigal. I picture the prodigal's dad on the front porch, maybe in a rocking chair, having his quiet time every morning, and he's waiting on the Lord while he was watching for his son. Wait on the Lord. I was amazed this week as I got to look in. There are lots of verses that say that. And the subject is always the Lord himself. It's not waiting on the circumstance or wait on the prodigal. It's to wait on the Lord. Just a few of them. Psalm 38, 15. I wait for you, O Lord. Psalm 5, 3. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait. The, the wait is on the Lord. In expectation. Psalm 119, 147. I rise before dawn, I cry for help, and I wait for your words. Now, for me, that is a total perspective change. Instead of waiting on someone or on something, what a greater subject than to wait on the Lord. You know, Psalm, you know Isaiah chapter 40, you know the very last verse in that, in that psalm. Let's go ahead and put, put that up on the screen, okay, guys? Isaiah 40, 31. How many of you have taken solace in that verse before? Many times, have we not? Yeah, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk. And not faith. On whom are they waiting? Wait on the Lord. Yeah, we're not waiting on a person. We're not waiting on a circumstance to change. Our weight is better placed, is it not? On the Lord. What gives this verse great strength for me as I think about it? is uh, what appears earlier in Isaiah chapter 40. Those of you who have your Bibles may want to just look at that chapter. There are actually two sections in Isaiah 40 that talk about the one on whom we're waiting, how big he is. Up there about verse 12, it starts talking about how big God is. I've actually mentioned this verse before with us. You've seen it before. We're waiting on the God who measures the sky with his hands. As many as a billion, billion galaxies. Measure that with his hand. Starts out with that series of rhetorical questions. Can anyone measure the ocean by handful? Some of you were at the ocean this week. Just imagine that. God's measuring the ocean as if it were to fit in the palm of his hand. That's a big God. Can anyone measure the ocean by handfuls or measure the mountains and hills on scales? Anybody been to the mountains lately? Think of the big old mountains as if he weighs them on scales. Talking about a big God. 
It talks about uh, a little bit further down, going down in Isaiah chapter 40. All of the animals in the forest of Lebanon are not enough for a sacrifice to our God. That's how big he is. Okay, let's put it in a context that we would understand. All of the animals in Colorado are not enough for a sacrifice to our God. And it goes on to say, and its trees are too few to kindle the fire. Big God. Big God. And it goes on to ask that question. To whom can the holy God be compared? Is there anyone else like him? Go on to that next slide. There it is right there. To whom can the holy God be compared? Is there anyone else like him? Get this image. Look up at the sky. Picture back in your mind when you have seen the most starry sky that you've ever seen. For me, it was out at the uh, Paisano Baptist encampment, just west of Alpine. Gene goes out in that country every week. And it's high, and it's dry, and it's far, far away from any big city. I remember one night, I was out at the Paisano camp, and I got out of my truck, and it was one of those no-moon nights, no-cloud nights. When I got out of the truck... The stars were so breathtaking. I remember the, the way it felt. It felt like I would bump my head on them. Stars. So think of the time that you've seen the most stars you've ever seen. Maybe a time that you've been able to distinguish the Milky Way going across the sky. Think of that with this image right here. Look up at the sky. Who created the stars you see? Get the image, the one who leads them out like an army. He knows how many there are, and he calls each one by name. Calls them by name. Then this next statement is the one that's the most powerful in this chapter to me. His power is so great, not one of them is ever missing. Not one. So those of us who have a prodigal in our lives for whom we're waiting. Just think. He's not missing from God. God's right there where he is. Right there where she is. And nobody can stray out of the surveillance of a caring God. He knows them by name. Not one, not one is ever missing. So maybe we need to redefine our idea of what it means for one to be missing, to go missing. Remember, it was such a trivial thing when I was in seminary, and one day I'd lost my wallet. And I was fretting over that, and I'd already looked at all the places that I needed to go look, and it's unlike me to lose something like that. It's not characteristic. Now, my wife is well practiced at losing her phone. I've already told you about that and other stuff. And her keys. And, uh, uh, but it's uncharacteristic. My stuff stays in the right place in my pockets. I have everything in order usually, but I'd lost my wallet. And I had searched for a day or two, and I could not find it. And one of the reasons that was so important to me is not only because of whatever little bit of money may have been in it, but it was in my wallet that also kept my calendar. And I worked for a ministry that had a whole bunch of stuff going on that I didn't dare try to keep in my mind. I had all of my agenda written down in that wallet, and I'd lost it. And I was really worried about it. One night I laid down and I was fretting over the lost wallet. And I thought, you know, if God knows us where all the stars are, I'll bet you he may even know where my wallet is. And so I said, okay, God, where is it? Instantly. I can only credit this to the Lord because I already, I'd already gone to look at all the places I knew to look. And as if, as if he said as clearly as if he had said it out, out loud, it's under the armrest in your truck. I got up out of bed, I went out, got in my truck, opened up the armrest, and there it was. That was such a good reminder of me. A lot more important than that I'd found my wallet. God always knows where the prodigal is. He's always real close to them. 
None of them are ever out of his sight. None of them is ever out of his care. That God cares for the prodigal. Remember, that was the whole point of the three parables in Luke chapter 15. The importance of the lost ones. And you know what? If, if they're important to God, then uh, I don't need to try to convince God how important they are, do I? No, he's already there. He's so far ahead of me. In fact, if I even care, it's because God gives me his care for the prodigal. He makes me care for a friend with whom I've had great fellowship. But then there's some distance there, maybe running even from God. And so if I even care about them, it's not because I'm such a great guy and so noble. It's because God does. And he's the one who's put his care for them on my heart. And so that I can be a partner with him in retrieving them. See, the weight is not for the prodigal or for the circumstance to change. The weight is on the Lord. And, you know, it's like I can put this burden that I feel so often so clearly. It keeps me awake at night. I can put it where it belongs in the first place, can I? And wait on the Lord. Waiting on Him. What are some verbs that would be synonymous with the way that we're using that word wait in all of these Bible passages? Some verbs that would be synonymous with, with that. How about trust? Okay. It's not up to me. It's up to the Lord. Now, he may use me in the pursuit of the one who's lost. That's why he told these stories. So the guys who are sitting on the back row would get it, how important the lost ones are to him. And so I can count on him. He's caring. He's working. Remember, he's prodding. You know, he's with them. He's, they're never out of his sight. And that I can just be in partnership with him. And when we're going at his pace, I'm okay. He's not going to run ahead of me. I'll go at his pace, and it'll be okay. I don't know if any of you have ever read of Philip Yancey. He's one of my favorite Christian authors. In fact, when we were in language school down in Costa Rica, we had an annual, I guess it was spiritual emphasis week at the school, the language school. And uh, this particular year, Philip Yancey was our speaker. And so I'd already read some of his books. I was really looking forward to him. And, and uh, when he came, it was no disappointment. Really, really appreciated his thoughtfulness and his sensitivity. Anybody with me read any of Philip Yancey's stuff? You do well to do so. One of his books is called Vanishing Grace. And the, uh, the title is written to draw us in. You know, if I see a book, Vanishing Grace, how could that be? But uh, really thoughtful read, and he's such a thoughtful guy, and he's a Bible scholar, and so a great heart and great mind come together with Philip Yancey's stuff. And this is what he wrote in that book, Vanishing Grace. Listen to this with me. In my lifelong study of the Bible, I've looked for an overarching theme, a summary statement of what the whole sprawling book is about. I've settled on this. Are you ready? God gets his family back. From the first book to the last, the Bible tells of wayward children and the, get the language of this next statement, the torturous lengths to which God will go to bring them back home. Man, that is good. For a man who's studied the Bible academically all of his life and with all of his heart for him to say, if I had to make one statement about the Bible, this is it. God gets his family back. He gets them back. So, you know, recently we've lost some folks from our church family, haven't we? You know what those losses represent? God gets them back. Yeah. We had a loss in our extended church family this week. And you know what that means? God gets him back. God gets him back. My great, great grandfather, his name was, was Madison Freeman Price. And uh, he and his 
teenage wife settled in East Texas in 1858. It was before Abraham Lincoln was elected president. And they built a log cabin on our farm that we still have today. A few years ago, we, we refurbished it in his honor, Madison Freeman Price's honor, thanking him for the investment that he made in our lives by settling there and caring for that place until he left to go and fight in the Civil War. And uh, while he was doing that, he spent most of that time sick. I think most of the uh, Confederate soldiers spent most of the war sick. And we have numerous letters, 20-something letters, that we found just five years ago in a box under a bed in my grandparents' house. The letters that he wrote to my great-great-grandmother, Jane, and uh, we got to read his letters. But you know what? Madison Freeman Price never came home. And to our knowledge, we never heard that anybody even knew where he went. Sorry my mic's giving me trouble, guys. I guess my mic's a prodigal this morning, isn't it? But Madison Freeman Price didn't come home. And we don't know. We don't know what happened. But he already had a son and a daughter. And they stayed and they grew up and they kept the place and passed it on to my grandparents and then my parents. And now it's our turn to pay the taxes on the place. But uh, he never came home. So we know what it's like to have one and we just don't know the end of the story. You know, in our minds anyway, they're perpetually lost. Well, in 1990, the remains of a Confederate soldier were found in uh, North Carolina. And I guess it was because of some of the remains of the clothing or maybe buttons or... Anyway, there was some indication that this had been a, a Confederate soldier's body and just bones that were left. And so those were respectfully buried in a cemetery and they put this headstone at that grave. Cool. Oh. And so I connect that with this story. For those for whom I'm still waiting, for those for whom the wait is over, and even there was some lack of resolution that was not resolved. Well, I like what Philip Yancey wrote. God gets his family back. For me, that takes me all the way back to the first point, don't freak out. So those of you who are parents, if you haven't had a time yet, you will. Let me know if you don't, okay? But I think each of us as parents have, has had a time that our son or our daughter took the prodigal's path. And so think of these reasons why we don't need to freak out. We really can trust God with them, with that which is most important to us. Can we not? Yeah. I hope this helps you. These are the things that have been helping me. They help me a great deal. And that uh, my trust is not in man. It really is in the Lord himself. And I'll continue to wait for him. And I don't have to freak out while I do that. Never can tell what's going on in the life and the heart of somebody who may be in this room on any given Sunday morning. But if uh, there's some of you are, who are in, in, in the darkness of waiting, you're waiting on God to move, waiting on maybe God to change some circumstances, then you're in an awfully good place to do so. And uh, sorry I keep fussing with this mic. But... Uh, Let's, let's finish like this today, okay? Um, we have that kind of Lord that we can put all of our trust in, guys. We can put it all in Him. We can put it all in Him. And sometimes I can come to a resolution in my heart, but until I've shared it with somebody else, it doesn't even get to me all the way. Do you that way too? 